Hi, my name is Tracy Langston. I'm a neonatal nurse with 10 years of experience and I'm also a graduate student in East Carolina University's nursing education program. Today we're going to be showing you the initial assessment of a newborn baby. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about the delivery room and what you would do for your initial resuscitation of a newly born infant and then we will go through and do a full head to toe assessment. The first thing you want to do when you're attending a delivery is to make sure that the environment is ready and that you have all of your equipment ready to receive the baby. You want to make sure that you turn up the temperature in the room. It needs to feel warm to you so that the baby will be warm after it's born. You also want to have an overbed warmer. You will go ahead and turn this on and turn the overbed warmer all the way up to high. This will allow it to be preheated before you place the baby on the overbed warmer. We also want to take two or three layers of blankets and lay them out on the overbed warmer so that they are also heating up while you're waiting for the baby to be born. In a basic delivery, you want to have something for suction, so you can use a simple bulb suction or you can have wall suction. You do want some type of oxygen delivery, so today we have an Ambu bag that we could use and you want to have a hat to place on the baby. This is also for thermoregulation because the baby's going to lose the most amount of heat from their head. You want to know a little bit about the maternal history before the baby's born if you have time and a little bit about the labor if there was any type of complications. It's nice to know if your baby is term or preterm and if there's any meconium in the amniotic fluid. So today we're going to assume that we have a term newborn infant with an uncomplicated labor and delivery and there's no significant maternal history. So when the baby's born, the baby will be placed on your overbed warmer. You do want to make sure that you go ahead and start your timer. This timer will alarm when it's at one minute and at five minutes so that you can remember to do your APGAR scores. When the baby's placed on the bed, the first thing you're going to do is dry and stimulate your infant at the same time. You're drying him, of course, for thermoregulation purposes. You want to stimulate your baby gently um, to get your baby to start breathing. You don't want to be too vigorous with your baby, just some gentle stimulation. We're going to make sure we apply the hat to our baby. And then we could suction the mouth and the nose if needed, and you always want to suction the mouth before the nose. Make sure you depress your bulb syringe first, put it in the mouth, and then let go to suction, and then we would do the nose. You want to observe the color of your baby. You also want to monitor the heart rate of your baby. If you have a baby who is screaming and crying, then you know your heart rate is above 100. But to check, you can palpate at the base of the umbilical cord right after delivery before it's been clamped. And you can also listen with your stethoscope for the heartbeat. While you auscultate the heartbeat, it's a good idea to sort of tap your finger for a visual cue for the other members of the resuscitation team so that they can visually see if it's too slow or if it's an appropriate rate. And our goal is to have the heartbeat above 100. So assuming that we have a pink baby who's crying with the heart rate above 100, there's no complications, then there would be no further steps as far as resuscitation of that baby. So at one minute and five minute you need to make sure that you record your APGAR score. APGAR is for the appearance, the pulse, grimace, activity, and respirations. So the appearance of the baby is the color of the baby. Is our baby nice and pink or is our baby cyanotic? Acrocyanosis is bluish coloring to the hands and feet only, which is normal. We don't want to see any central cyanosis, especially around the mouth and lips. Then we go on to the pulse. So is our heart rate appropriate, which would be above 100? We don't want it to be less than 100. We especially don't want it to be less than 60, which would be an indicator for more extreme resuscitation measures such as chest compressions and medications. 
grimace of our baby is how they respond to your touch and stimulation. So do they cry, which would be a normal response of a newborn? Do they just make a slight grimace with their face or is there no response? They're completely lethargic. Activity is like their tone or movement. So do they have good tone? A well newborn is going to try to keep their arms and their legs flexed close to their body and if you gently pull on them they will have some resistance as they try to pull their arm or leg back towards their body. There should also be a little bit of movement um, while they're awake and being stimulated. On the extreme end of that you don't want them to be completely flaccid and lethargic which would be the way our mannequin is right now with the arms not flexed and just lying on the bed. Same thing with the legs. They would be in sort of a frog leg position with the knees opened up and just lying on the bed. And then your respiratory efforts. You want to have a good respiratory effort. They're breathing on their own with no respiratory distress, no retractions, nasal flaring, or grunting. For each of those five categories, your baby will get a score of 0, 1, or 2 for a total score of 0 to 10, and 10 is the highest, which is what we want to see in our baby because that would be a good indicator in all five of those categories of a nice pink, crying infant with a good heart rate and good tone. Now at this point, after you have resuscitated your baby, you've dried your baby, you want to make sure that you change out your blankets and have nice new warm blankets that are not wet. Then you can allow the family members to come over, um, if there's a support person with mom to see the baby. You could even let them help you cut the cord and clamp the cord and give them a moment to take some pictures of their baby. Then you want to move on to weighing the baby because we do want to get a weight as soon as possible after birth for the most accurate birth weight. You want to make sure that you place a chucks pad or a blanket on your scale so that you don't have a cold scale that you're placing your baby on. Turn it on after you've placed that on there so that it zeroes with the chucks or blanket on the bed. And then you would place your infant on the scale and you want to make sure that you've removed a diaper or hat or any blankets and preferably the baby needs to be up here and stop moving around um, and be somewhat still to allow the weight to calculate and then you can go between pounds and ounces and kilograms. Now that we have resuscitated our baby we want to go through and do a full head to toe assessment of our newborn. Remember to be flexible in your assessment. We would like to work in a head-to-toe fashion, but if your baby is nice and calm and quiet, you would want to take that opportunity to go ahead and do your auscultation of your heart and lung sounds and your bowel sounds. Um, so you do have to be a little bit flexible in the order that you do your assessment when it comes to newborns. But for the purposes of this video, we are going to work in a head-to-toe fashion. You want to make sure that you have your stethoscope. Um, you're going to need a blood pressure cuff and a thermometer to make sure you get your vital signs. You're going to need a device to take measurements for the length and head circumference of your baby. So we're going to start just by observation of our infant. We want to look at their overall appearance. We want to look at the color of our infant. Um, we're going to take this opportunity to look for um, symmetry, we're going to make sure that they have a good respiratory effort. Um, are they nice and pink? Do they look a little bit pale? Just overall appearance of your baby. This is a good time to really look at the skin. There are numerous um, skin conditions that you can see in the newborn. And it's nice to know just an overview of some of those and what may be normal versus what's abnormal. So look at your skin. Of course, you're going to look at the color. The newborn infant may have vernix on them still, which is a sort of cheesy white substance just after delivery. And that's normal, and you would just wipe that off as needed. I'm looking for any rashes or abnormalities on the skin. Um, and make sure that you look 
over the full um, surface of your infant as well as turning them over or lifting them up to look at the back as well for any abnormalities. You may see some birthmarks. There may be a hemangioma or what we call a stork bite on the back of the neck. You may see milia on the face, which are just small little white bumps across the cheeks and bridge of the nose. Those are all normal. Um, you may see on the back side of your infant, usually right above the buttocks, what we call a Mongolian spot, which is sort of a dark gray or bluish discoloration. This is going to be more common in your dark skin infants, and again, that's normal and will go away with time. Usually, after about two to three days of life, many infants develop what we refer to as just a normal newborn rash or erythema toxicum. And this is usually mostly on the trunk of the um, baby, not typically on the face, although it, although it could be. It's definitely not going to be on the palms or soles of the feet. That would be an abnormal sign. And this is just a very widespread, small red rash. That would be normal. There may be some small little brown spots called cafe au lait spots. Those can be normal as well. A wide variety of things, and if you're ever in doubt, just get a second opinion. Let another nurse or the provider come over and take a look at what you found, um, and they can help you determine if it's normal or abnormal. So now we're going to start with the head. You do want to keep the hat on your baby as much as possible, so we would only remove it for this portion of the exam to examine the head of our baby. I'm looking at the facial features for symmetry. I want to look at the eyes. Are they symmetrical? Are they of a normal shape? The nose as well. Is it symmetrical? Are there any abnormal um, or obvious abnormalities? Look at the nares. Notice now if there's any nasal flaring, which would be a sign of respiratory distress. You do want to just check patency of the nostrils. You can just sort of gently occlude one side at a time to make sure the baby is still able to breathe and has nice patency. I want to look at the mouth. Of course, I want to make sure there's not any bluish discoloration along the lips. Check the mucous membranes. You want to look inside the mouth, look at the gums. There can be neonatal teeth. There can also be what we call Epstein pearls, which are just tiny little white dots on the gums. If um, those are normal, if you do see teeth, you would want to let someone know and they would need to come look at those because they could possibly need to be removed. With a clean gloved finger, you would want to feel the soft and hard palate of the mouth to make sure there's not a cleft palate. You're also, of course, looking for a cleft lip. When you have the finger in the mouth, that would be a good time to also see if you can elicit the suck reflex because that should be present. I want to look at the ears. They should be symmetrical. Um, you want to look at the external structure to make sure you don't see any obvious abnormalities to make sure that it is fully developed. And then you want to make sure your ears are in line with your eyes. Low set ears could be um, associated with some different syndromes. You also want to feel your fontanelle, so your anterior fontanelle as well as your posterior fontanelle. These should be soft and flat. If it's bulging or if it's sunken in, then those are both abnormal findings. I'm going to feel the suture lines and see if they're overriding or if they're separated. Remember that the plates of the skull have not fused together yet to allow for molding of the head during the birthing process. So if they're separated, you're going to feel a little indentation between the plates. And if they're overriding, then you'll feel a little ridge where they have come one on top of the other. Both of those are normal findings. It just depends on how the head was molded during the birthing process. I also want to just gently move my head from side to side to check for range of motion. I'm also going to feel along the clavicles to check for any fractures that may have happened during the birthing process. And I also want to look at the back of my neck to make sure there's no cyst. Okay. The last thing that I'm going to do with the examination of the head is I just want to gently feel all along the head. And I'm also inspecting because I'm looking for any 
bruising or abrasions that may have happened during the birth process and feeling for any swelling um, or knots. Now that we're done with the head, we're going to move on to the chest. This is where we will listen to the heart and lung sounds and do our respiratory and cardiovascular assessments. So first you want to, of course, listen to your breath sounds. Remember to listen bilaterally. There may be a few crackles right after birth, just from some fluid that hasn't cleared the lungs yet. Make sure that they are equal, however, on both sides. You would want to certainly let someone know if you have decreased breath sounds on one side versus the other. You're also looking at the respiratory effort of your infant. You want to look for any retractions. You can have um, intercostal retractions, which would be in between the ribs. You can have substernal retractions or suprasternal retractions, which would be above or below the rib cage. And that's just going to be that sucking in appearance of the skin with inspiration. You want to look for any nasal flaring, which would also be a sign of respiratory distress, and listen for any, any grunting, which would be a sign of respiratory distress. Remember that babies are diaphragmatic breathers, meaning that you're going to see a lot of movement in the abdomen when they breathe, which is normal. They're also nose breathers, which is a um, reason why you really want to make sure that there's patency of thin airs because um, they prefer to breathe out of their nose. They're not going to automatically open their mouth the way that we would if the um, nares were occluded. Okay. We've auscultated breath sounds, we've looked at our respiratory effort, now we want to auscultate the heart sounds. We're going to listen um, for the rate and the rhythm or the regularity of the rhythm. We also want to listen for any murmurs, which would be a turbulence of blood flow. A murmur within the first 24 to 48 hours after birth could be normal as the baby is completing that circulation transition process. Um, after that time period, if you hear a murmur, you would definitely want to let someone know about that. Um, and it's never a bad idea if you hear a murmur even in the first 24 hours to just let someone know and let them listen behind you to check for that. Um, so we would listen to the heart sounds. I prefer to switch to the bell of the stethoscope when I'm listening for a murmur. With your cardiovascular exam, you're also going to um, feel for your pulses, so brachial pulses as well as femoral pulses. You want to check these bilaterally, and then you also want to feel your brachial and your femoral pulse at the same time. If there's a big difference between the two, then that could be a sign of a cardiac abnormality, so you would need to notify someone of that. You also want to check your blood pressure. Your cuff can be applied to the upper arm or the calf, and you do want to get a blood pressure in your upper extremities and your lower extremities. Again, if there's a significant difference between the two, that could be a sign of a cardiac abnormality, so you would need to notify someone of that. The last thing we want to check is our capillary refill. So how is our perfusion? The best way to check capillary refill in the newborn is not on the fingertips as you would with an adult. You want to press over a bony surface such as the sternum, or the knee, and you would press and hold for five seconds, and then let go. The skin would be blanched, and you would count how long it takes for the blood flow to return to that area, which should be less than three seconds. That's also um, a good way to assess for jaundice of your baby. Jaundice does work from um, the head down, so it's going to start in the face first and then work its way down. So you could press on the forehead or on the nose, and when you release your finger, instead of the skin being that pale color, if it has a yellowish tint, then you would know that you um, have some jaundice going on. Okay, now that we've completed the cardiovascular exam, we would move on to the abdomen. Of course, you want to auscultate your bowel sounds in all four quadrants.
And then we're just observing the abdomen. You want to note if it's distended or if it's sunken in. If you have a scaphoid abdomen, then that could be a sign of a diaphragmatic hernia, meaning your abdominal contents have moved up into your chest wall, so that would not be a good sign. So you should just have a nice round um, stomach. When you palpate, it should be nice and soft. The baby shouldn't um, grimace as if they were in pain when you're palpating the stomach. If it's very distended and firm, um, there's a couple of options. It may not be anything too severe. It may just be that they got some air or fluid in their belly from delivery and or the resuscitation. You may want to just drop in an NG or OG tube and suction out or aspirate anything that may be on the stomach. It's very common for them to have a lot of fluid in their stomach after delivery. Um, so you could check that, and if that relieves it, then that's great. If it remains distended and it feels kind of firm, I would go ahead and get an abdominal girth measurement. That way you could start tracking that and see if it changes. Okay, so now from down from the abdomen, we're moving on to the genitalia of our infant. So if this is a female, then um, the labia majora are going to be most prominent, and they may look swollen, which is normal. You do want um, to make sure, though, that the external structure of the vagina looks normal, that things are symmetrical, um, that there's no ambiguous genitalia. Um, you do want to look at the inguinal area, and while you're palpating for your femoral pulses in the male or female, it's a good time to just palpate that inguinal area for any hernias. In the female, there may be some whitish or even pink-tinged discharge after birth and in the first couple of days, and that's a good thing to let the parents know that that's normal, that's just from hormones from mom, so that they're not too alarmed. In the male infant, you want to look at the penis and the scrotum. So with the penis, you're just making sure that um, nothing looks abnormal. You also want to look at the urinary meatus and make sure that it's midline, um, that it's not on the underside or the top side of the penis. You also want to look at the scrotum. Um, it should be nice and pink. If there's any discoloration, then you would need to let someone know immediately. It should be pink. It may be a little swollen as well, and that could be normal. Um, hopefully, it's just filled with fluid, which is calling this, causing the swelling. Um, if it does have, if it's firm and has a discoloration, then again, that could be from um, testicular torsion, and that would be an emergent situation. If you shine a transilluminator or a light on the scrotal sac. Um, if it's just fluid field, then that whole um, scrotum is going to illuminate from the transillumination um, and letting you know that it is just fluid, and that would be okay. You do want to palpate for the testes. They should be distended in a term newborn. A preterm newborn, they may still be in the inguinal canal, and you could just feel along that canal to make sure that you do feel the testicles, as well as feeling in the scrotal sac if they have distended, just to make sure that they're there. You also want to look at the anus of your baby. We do want to make sure that it's patent, and the best way we do this is to do a rectal temperature. You need to get a temperature after your baby has been born as part of your assessment anyway. Um, so you can do your rectal temperature, and that's also going to assess the patency of the anus. The baby should pass meconium in that first 24 hours. Um, make sure you document that, because if your baby doesn't pass meconium, then it may be a cause for concern. The baby is probably only going to void possibly just once in the first 24 hours. It could take anywhere from, from 12 to 24 hours before they do void. A lot of times when the babies are born, they void right there after delivery. And if that happens, please remember to document that. It may be the only time within that first day that they void, so you want to make sure that gets documented so that people don't miss it and think there's a problem going on. Okay, now we're going to move on to the musculoskeletal system. 
We want to look at the tone of our baby. Um, as we mentioned before with the APGAR scoring, you want nice tone with your infant. The newborn likes to keep their extremities flexed and close to their body, um, so they shouldn't just be lying out to the side and lying flaccid on the bed. You want to make sure that they have nice, good um, muscular tone. If you try to sort of pull on the extremity, there should be a little bit of resistance because they're going to have the tendency to want to pull that back in close to their body. And that would be a good sign. Please remember to always look at the back side of your infant. We mentioned with skin that you need to observe the skin on the back. You want to feel along the spine to make sure it's nice and straight and everything is symmetrical. We're looking for any openings in the skin, which would not be a good sign. If you notice a deep dimple in the skin, especially a dimple with a tuft of hair, then that could be a sign of a neurological um, issue or a neural tube defect, so you would need to let someone know about that. We also just want to look at our extremities. Look at all of your digits. Make sure you have the appropriate number of digits. On all of your extremities, there can be extra digits or just some small skin tags that you would need to make note of. Um, and again, just looking at the overall appearance and color and any sort of obvious abnormalities, such as if the legs are abnormally bowed, if the feet are turned inwards, um, you want to check the hips. As you abduct and adduct the hips, you want, with gentle pressure, you want to feel along the hip joint to see if you feel any clunks or clicking, which could be a sign of a dislocated hip, okay? Also on the back side of the baby, the gluteal folds and skin folds should be symmetrical on both sides. If they're uneven, then that could be a sign um, of something with your hips going on. You also want to take some simple measurements of your infant. You would have already weighed your infant. You do want to do a head circumference. So over the top of the ears, right along the eyebrows, you're going to note the head circumference. You do also want to get a length from crown to heel with the leg fully extended. So the top of the head all the way down, extend out your leg to the heel. You can measure with your tape or you can mark on your blanket the top of the head and the top of the heel with a pen and then measure that way. Either way would be appropriate. The last part of our exam is the neurological exam. So for a neuro assessment, we want to check for reflexes in the infant that should be present. The sucking reflex, as we mentioned earlier, so with a clean gloved finger, you would just um, put your finger in the infant's mouth along the roof of the mouth and they should start sucking on your finger. If you put your finger in the palm of the infant, then they should grasp your finger, which is a reflex. If you stroke along the cheek of the infant, they should sort of turn their head to that side and start opening their mouth as if they were going to start eating, and that is the rooting reflex. The Babinski reflex, if you stroke along the um, sole of the foot, then they're going to sort of splay their little toes um, or curl their toes in. And they should have a startle reflex. So you'll notice that if you sort of come up on them unexpectedly or if there's a loud noise, um, then they're going to kind of startle and that would be a normal reflex. Also with the neurological exam, you want to just listen to their cry. They should have a normal sounding cry. It shouldn't be a very high pitched squeal or shrill of a cry. That can be an abnormal neurological sign. They should also have appropriate responses to touch. Um, their sensory responses should be normal. You would expect them um, to cry when you're touching them. They should sort of withdraw their extremities if they have good tone. If they're not responding to touch, especially pain, then that would be an abnormal neurological sign. That's an overview of the head-to-toe assessment of the newborn infant, and thank you for watching this video. 
This is the Giraffe Omni Bed I select, and we're just going to go through and show you some of the basic functions of how to use this bed. You need to make sure that the bed is plugged in in order for it to work. Um, without a battery pack on the isolette, it's not going to have a heat source unless it's plugged in. So you would plug it in and then you would turn the bed on. And to open the bed, there's two options. You can use the foot pedal at the bottom or you can use the up arrow on the side. Once the bed opens, it's going to alarm because it wants you to turn on the overbed warmer setting. So you can turn it up as high as you want. You'll notice that when the top of the bed opened, the doors on the radiant warmer opened as well. So now it's functioning as an overbed warmer. It does have the capability to allow you to plug in a temperature probe and attach that to your baby. And you can monitor the baby's temperature with the temp probe. The sides of the isolette, you're going to squeeze the buttons together and pull down the side to open it up. This allows you access to the baby. You can also pull down the front of the bed so that the head of the infant can be easily accessed as well. The whole tray of the bed can slide out in either direction as well as you can rotate this sort of like a Lazy Susan. You can also elevate or lower the head of the bed in either direction. There is a scale built into this isolette and you would need it um, flat in order to use the scale. There's also an x-ray tray under the baby that slides out so that you can shoot x-rays through this without having to move the infant. There's a drawer underneath to allow for supplies. Um, put the sides of the bed up. There are portholes. You can allow access that way. Ideally, especially with your premature infants, which is mostly what will be in this isolette, you want to keep the isolette closed as much as possible to keep all of the heat inside. So the preferred method to access your baby would be through the portholes, but if you were doing more invasive procedures, you could put the sides down and raise the top of the bed up. Um, there's foot pedals on the bottom of the bed that allows you to adjust the height of your bed to a good working level. You also have brakes on the foot pedals to make sure that it stays stationary.